Um, I'm I'm going to hand over to Paul Revel now. We're going to head into a, a session where we're maybe to ask some questions and, and things. So um, Paul's going to chair that. The rest of us on the team will be looking for questions and hands raised, but we've, we've got a few questions that are started so that, that, are, that we've, we've picked up from um, some of your questions in the chat, but then we'll, we'll probably open the floor. So we've got a little bit of time now to question the speakers um, and I'll hand over to Paul. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, and just to introduce myself, I uh, am one of the regional ministers for the Northern Baptist Association, so work across the northeast. And first of all, just to thank our, our speakers, we've had uh, what feels like a biodiversity, lots of different approaches uh, to, to the ecological challenges that we're facing. So thank you very much uh, for what you've contributed. I already had lots of uh, questions in, so I'll, I'll start with one on, um, on money. Um, and, and again, because Zoom, the nature of Zoom, I'll maybe pick on uh, a speaker to start off with and then uh, others can contribute uh, in response. And, but coming back to money, um, recognising that to go green, it costs money. It's a, a, sometimes an expensive alternative and we're living in a, a poorer part of uh, the UK. Any thoughts on uh, how we uh, combat that challenge that it's an expensive uh, alternative way of life. Yeah, just coming from a theological angle, I just think, I said to my group, you know, Jesus never held the purse, okay, and he gave it to Judas, and we know what happened there, and the reason I think it happened, uh, went wrong for him was because the disciples didn't say to him, how are you doing with the purse, brother? You don't look like you're doing so great, and I think the key thing here is accountability to the church is to say, how are you doing with the, with the money in individual churches, and obviously in the national networks, but you know, it's going to take deep sacrifice. You know, so there are some there are some um, models being purported at the moment, which says that we're going to have to go back to rationing from a governmental directive. The church should be leading the way and saying we can find the money. Now, I'm not talking about individual church communities. I appreciate what you said, Paul. Some some are poorer than others, but we just need to really theologically understand the danger of starting with a capitalist mindset and starting from the money rather than starting from actually, if we don't. This is going to cost us far more in the long run. You know, you try mitigating against climate change and we're in real trouble. So that's just my kind of thing. Anyone's talking about money? Jesus never held the purse. Savvy, savvy. And we follow him. Just my throw in to start the conversation. Thank you. Yes. Any of the other contributors want to add to it? Paul? Yeah. See your hand there. Yes. Um, the two thoughts. First of all, not everything costs money or not everything costs very much money. And a lot of the simple steps around biodi biodiversity really don't need to cost money or they don't need to cost any more than the kind of money that individual parishioners would be able to um, help with. And the other thing is, I mean, I, I do recognise some some of the big some some are big ticket items. Uh, you, we're going to have to do them. We're going to have to do them at some point over the next 20 years. So we better start planning now. Um, but but the, the, my other main point is you need to look at the money not just in today. Quite a lot of the investments uh, w would actually pay back, but over some years. So it needs some clever um, um, money minds here. Things like um, solar panels on buildings, you can't do it on them all, I know, but things like that, um, they tend to pay back over about six or seven years. By that time... Um, you're getting you're getting payback. That's actually not a bad investment um, return. So it may seem like a lot, but in the, uh, in the longer term, a lot of the investments you might not that you might be looking for will not do you any harm at all as an organisation. And, and finally, crowdfunding. You'd be you might be amazed at how much people in the congregation might be willing to chip into something that will be significantly a good thing to do. And just looking for some crowdfunding opportunities. I know certainly of a number of schools that just opened up the thought that they wanted to put solar panels on their roof. They'd got the cost fully paid within days by by doing a crowdfunding um, uh, effort among the parents. Um, yeah, good luck with that. I just wanted to add if oh, anybody and first yeah sorry and then yeah and then, yeah. yeah if anyone's yeah. thinking I haven't got the money I can't you know in my own life I can't afford to cut my emissions I just don't have any money to spare then yeah there are definitely many things that they can do that cost time rather than money or cost little money but I'd also say remember that on the whole the bigger your income the bigger your emissions so don't start feeling guilty because you're short of money mm -hmm. Thank you. And Pam? Uh, sorry, I was muted before. Um, I was. I started saying it hasn't been our experience as a church that 
becoming a gold eco church has cost us money. We have actually saved money. I know as individuals, if you're saying, you know, try and buy organic food, um, it is a bit more expensive, but the more people buy it, the lower the prices will become because there's a demand and, and, and the, the, the prices will be driven down. So those of us who can should in order to drive the prices down so that other people can afford them. But, but actually, if you shop around for your electricity and the, your power and that sort of thing, we, we've, we've found it hasn't cost us extra. Thank you. That, that's great. Um, another kind of similar sort of question about uh, uh, barriers that we face, and th this is um, about rural areas, but uh, in rural areas where there's often very little public transport uh, and, and the requirement to travel to, to, to get your, your basic services. Um, how do we live a more green lifestyle in when, when uh, culture and society and, and, and structures seem to be against us? Any thoughts on, on that? wonder if maybe we could start with, uh, with Paul on this one. I think in, in the rural environment, yes, there are some things that make it harder, um, the, the, the likely need to, to, to travel, but there are some things that make it easier as well. Um, greater opportunities to be living close to the land, greater opportunities to be greening your own um, environment. If you're living in the countryside, um, you need a good reason not to be planting some trees around you really now. now. And um, Joanne will be saying something a bit later, I think, about the Northeast Community Forest that we've been involved in pulling together a partnership to do. But I'm just hoping that almost everybody during this year, during this autumn's planting season, will make sure that they can plant at least one tree. And I hope everybody in every organisation, every individual can think next year we're going to plant a dozen trees one way or another, either on our own property or in, uh, with friends or, or somewhere else. Um, uh, so that's that's one point. Um, but actually, even with the issue of, of cars, you know, at some point over the next 20 years, we're all going to have to rethink our use of cars. Um, this is not an easy one. This is one of those that is likely to take a certain de degree of sacrifice, but maybe not as much as we expect. I think in 20 years, most people will be sharing cars rather than owning their own. I think the idea of having a car that is used for maybe 45 minutes a day um, on average and sits outside for 23 and a quarter hours a day will just be seen as old fashioned. It's the way we used to work before uh, we opened our eyes and saw that we can be using resources in a different way and indeed not driving as much um, as we thought we needed to do. Th there are some things that, as I mentioned before, which are quick and easy and cheap changes. But over the next 20, 30 years, we're going to need to be changing our lifestyles and the next generation from us in the same way as we already today live differently to how people lived 30 years ago and how we lived 30 years ago. In 30 years time, it'll be very, very different. It will have to be. And we need to start getting ourselves sorted for that. Thank you. Any of our other contributors want to make a comment? Pam, I see your... Uh, yeah, just, I mean, while we're waiting for those changes to happen uh, and our mindsets to change, if we fill a car going to the shops um, with elderly folk who perhaps couldn't get otherwise, it, that we, we have a, a village car sharing scheme and uh, it makes a lovely social event for old folk who would otherwise be quite isolated. And it's one car going instead of three or four um, so it, it, it can have benefits to um, encourage community and support for each other. Thank you. I just wanted to add on trees. There's uh, lots of Anglican churches in Southern Africa have gotten a habit of planting a tree uh, whenever they celebrate something. So whether it's a wedding or a christening or the bishop's birthday or whatever it might be, they plant a tree to celebrate it. And uh, you might be able to do that in, if you're an urban church but it sounds easier if you're a rural one so i just wanted to suggest that as a great way to celebrate events thank you um rachel i'll ask you to start with the next question but just to pause before i do and say there's a few questions coming in about resources and uh ideas and i think <clears throat> what we'll try and do with those kind of questions is is invite our speakers before they leave us to uh, uh give us lists of resources and we'll share those out to you rather than um, speak them all by name right now. Uh, so, Rachie, uh, here's, here's, here's one where I think you will, uh, you've already touched on this really. How do we influence our church governing bodies around divesting in fossil fuels and other uh, key issues, sustainable heating, changing planning, 
uh, for listed buildings. Um, you can kick I mean, off. yeah, obviously Operation NOAA, basically head over, to, like you say, rather than take up time now, head over to Operation NOAA's website. Basically, <clears throat> we're the charity that have been working and supporting the churches to do this. So there's all the information there. The Bright Now campaign is what, what is our kind of flagship thing. Everything is there around uh, also, it's, but I would say it's a mind shift to the concept of joy in enough. We've been talking about. Paul's mentioned that now shifting through in terms of. So I think this is a metanoia change which churches have got to get their heads together on. This is something we joyfully start to change to do. But Operation Noah are there to help the actual logistics. James Buchanan and Bacani are the two guys who are heading up that and, and have been very successful. And, and follow us on all social media and, and retweet. Basically, the biggest way to get a church to sort itself out is to tell them that the church down the road has already done it, right? So I'm not being silly, but, you know, Peter Singh, we talked about the life you can save. Start telling people how great the stuff you're doing is, because then other people go, oh, other people are feeling really authentic and really joyful around this. Start to play off the churches against each other. No, I didn't say that. But yeah, basically shout about what how great other churches are doing and start to put pressure that way. Thank you. Anybody else wants to make a comment on uh, that issue of how we put pressure on the, the authorities within our denominations. Oh, and can I just jump in? Sorry, Paul, one quick thing I forgot to say. Sorry, um, and Jim, it says, I think churches need to really start to honour and love the outliers. So in churches in this movement, we need priests, pilgrims and activists. And I'm an activist for Christian Climate Action. And we need to really understand the voices of those on the edges calling for deep system change. So as churches who are calling for that pressure, please support us because what happens is we become almost too radical, but we need pilgrims, priests and activists, okay, to put pressure on all parts of the church system. That's my last point. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll move on with another question then, if we may. Um, and, and the next one's around buildings. Uh, many of us have uh, historic buildings, maybe large buildings, which are extremely inefficient to heat. Uh, require a lot of uh, work just to maintain, uh, or maybe only open one or two days a week. Um, and what do we do when we, we have these uh, huge environmental challenges of our own buildings? And maybe again, Pam, you could start us off with this one and uh, we'll see where we go around church buildings. Uh, well, if you have a church and a hall and the hall is smaller in the winter use the hall because it's less difficult to heat. I've known churches put up a marquee inside the church and just to air heat the area of the marquee to reduce their costs. I mean the, the, you, you can insulate maybe, you, maybe you can get permission to double glaze um, but there are some churches like my own which is very badly built and crumbles away and it's a constant drain of money for us but I, I think there are things you you can do if you think creatively it, it won't be perfect but it's a start and it's better than nothing. Thank you anyone else want to uh, add a comment on that one? Paul here um only just to say it, it it's not something you can duck forever um, uh, it's it's often one that I think churches put off because they know that they can't afford it and it's such a mega massive uh, problem. Um, I think you need to get started, get an expert in to provide advice. It may be that it is financially infeasible in the next five years, but if, if that's the case, then you need to start planning for it. So I would say don't don't put the blindfolds on. Um, the insulation um, and the heating within your buildings is possibly the biggest issue that you're going to need to face. Um, just because it's not easy doesn't mean you don't need to start looking at it head on. And also changing people's expectation that, you know, we have our people have their heating at home at 22, come to church, just have an extra jumper Sunday. You know, we need to start changing people's expectations around this. So it's, it's that lifestyle shift as well. Our friends in the Netherlands have a warm sweater Sunday every year. Yeah. They're, they're doing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we do it at Christmas, so why not on other days? Uh, <laughs> and and I, I would just want to add, surely if we've learned something over COVID, it is our buildings are not actually as important as we used to think they are, and we yeah. can the church no. relying on them as much as yeah. we can. Precisely, and if, if, if we have other churches locally that we could share the space for worship, then why not do that? Thank you. OK, um, we'll we'll move on. We've probably got time for a, another two or three questions. Um, some questions are coming around 
motivating people, uh, motivating those who are disinterested, uh, feel maybe that it's such a big problem they, they can't make a contribution, so why bother? And also on the flip side, uh, and I sometimes hear this from young people, uh, we hear so much about climate change in school, it's, it's banged on about all the time, and, and, and some people get desensitised to it uh, as an issue because it, it's almost over-communicated. How do we get that balance in communicating in ways that will motivate people to get involved in, in, in making a difference? Any, uh, let's start with, with uh, Ben on this one. Any thoughts on Yeah, thinking about young people particularly. So I think, uh, so Tiffon did some research recently uh, asking young people who said they went to church regularly or felt they belonged to a church, whether they were hearing much about climate from the front. So not just in conversation, but did they, see, did they see it as something the church cared about, something the church leader talked about? And on the whole, they said no, and when they did, it wasn't as much as they wanted. So I think if we want to keep our young people and reach out to young people, this needs to be part of what the church stands for. And then within that, I think where young people are, or anybody, feel overwhelmed, where they're feeling despair in the face of a huge issue that's just bigger than any one of us is, um, I think the church has a lot to bring to that. So we've got, we are people of hope. That's who we are. That's why we gather. Um, and that's something you, as um, one of the speakers said earlier about hearing from an atheist campaigner, we have, we have that hope. Uh, we have that spiritual side. We can pray. Um, and also we have the solidarity of knowing that we are part of a much bigger movement than just ourselves individually or our own local church. So we bring all of that hope to people and that's very powerful and also long before we'd heard the climate was changing we knew that the point of life wasn't to pile up as much stuff as we could in the time that we had so that's always who we've been thank you yes and i, I absolutely believe that that uh, uh we are a people of hope as you say and and, and mm. a gospel of hope and we should never lose that uh, that should be characteristic of christian people even in facing the greatest challenges. Yeah. And anyone else want to add a comment on how we, maybe most people outside of the church who don't have that uh, narrative of hope uh, to, to motivate them. Yeah, Paul, um, just to say, oh, go, go for it, Paul. Go, I'll go after okay. you. Um, I'll just be brief then because I said something about it in, in my talk, need to uh, accentuate the positive, um, not simply uh, do, do the disaster discussion and make it really practical, find things that are easily done because success breeds success and people that can feel that they could, they've made their church greener will be more willing to be supportive in helping to make their local community greener and influence the government to make the, 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 the nation greener. Agree with that completely, Paul. And just to say, I do a lot of coaching around teenagers who are absolutely overwhelmed with despair and depression. Working with a young lad recently, he couldn't get out of bed for months. And the concept that they need leaders out front, they need people of integrity out front. They also need people to tell the truth because they're completely on the on the ball about this. But they don't need false they don't need false optimism. And I think the key thing as Christians is I really can't stand this thin theology that it'll all be right in the end. It's all pie in the sky when you die. All the narrative around leaving earth and going to heaven. You know, I do not have any hope. I have, I'm sorry, any optimism. I do have hope and it's rooted in knowing who God is. But that's not, that's not to say I think we'll succeed because I, I can't comment on that. So I think it's something about being true and telling the truth and living in that integrity um, and then being people of sacrifice and, and who actually repent and lament. And I mean, these young people need to see the church repenting and lamenting and bringing grief circles and spaces where they can can process it. So definitely, definitely, definitely we need to reach out and actually tap into what's actually going on in terms of the psychology around this as well. Thank you, that was all very helpful. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll come to Paul again now. Um, we've had a few questions around um, working collaboratively uh, and, and maybe you could just uh, spell it out. How, 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 how does it, um, how is it possible for us to uh, work with other churches or other groups, uh, for example, in securing uh, um, different energy supplies and maybe putting uh, greater pressure on, on working collaboratively? Anything you want to say around the, the benefits and, and how practically we do it when we're maybe uh, wondering who we can connect with? 
Yeah, well, a uh, really good question. First of all, you're already making a start by looking at the, the extent to which you can uh, adopt one kind of trademark scheme for measuring your own progress. That in itself helps because it makes it less less complicated for each church to to start finding their own way forward but with, with a lot of these things such as the um uh, insulation or heat pumps or solar panels or um leds they look at they seem to be such high cost items but they're likely to be less so if you're able as a collective of churches to to be working with a particular supplier because often the suppliers the reason their costs are high is because uh, uh, everything is uncertain for them if they know that they're going to have a pipeline of work um, working through the churches across the northeast over a period of time they're more able to invest prices come down it's more of an opportunity for them to be employing young people locally to to pick up the skills to do things like um, putting on solar panels and, and and fitting insulation into old buildings so there is a financial motivation for working together as a group of churches and then it's a matter of finding um, having somebody as one of your uh, uh, kind of to lead on your behalf with some of those uh, discussions um, and identify some of the companies who are potentially ready to work with you um, in those kinds of projects but then there's others and I mentioned Joanne I know is going to say something about community forest we're working in partnership elsewhere there will be new opportunities which won't cost anything uh, coming into play um, and and uh, think and things like shifting uh, simply getting one source of advice as to what is the most renewable energy source for where you buy your electricity now that's straightforward and that's something where collectively all the churches here could have a really big impact almost overnight thank you i'm gonna pose one last question a theological question and, and we'll start with rachel because you've touched on theology um uh, you, you seem to be our resident theologian this morning <laughs> to have uh, ha have Logical perspective, but uh, how do we address in our churches? This might just be the Baptists uh, here, but uh, the question that mission is really should be about evangelism, uh, and and that anything to do with the climate is 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 much less important. So how can we love our? We're told to love our neighbour as ourselves and God first, right? How can we love our neighbour if there's nowhere for them to live on? I mean, fundamentally, when you have a, I I work with churches who um, uh, um, sort of pay for a youth work. They don't talk about climate. So the youth that they're looking to look after haven't got a world to live on. I mean, it's a total disconnect. You cannot love your neighbour as yourself if you're fundamentally split. Now, the other thing is, it's not savvy from the church. Mission, we are we are losing our young people. As you say, I work with youth. That's my job. Um, we, because fundamentally they're saying crops, we've got 60 harvests less potentially. What you're saying is of no relevance. So how can we how can we turn up in, in Mozambique and say, profess that we love the person's, say the soul of the person in front of us, but have no concept for the soul of the child or grandchild that's going to come after them? I mean, I felt that the Ben's point around the woman with the with the uh, the barn storage was so moving. So there's this complete disconnect. It's also a total misunderstanding of the theological part that we are nature. We're not above nature. We're not different from nature. We are nature. So there's that there's that very thin, poor theological understanding. So, yeah, that's just a, a, an opener. I'm sure other people can jump in on that. But, yeah, total disconnect. Thank you. Does anybody else want to jump in and, and have a last word on, on that theme? Ben. Yeah, just thinking if we want to evangelise our young people uh, and we have nothing to say on climate, then very few will listen. So even if you are not convinced, just for the sake of reaching out, you need to know what to say, at least, if you don't get it. And then, oh, <laughs> which part of you is missing so that you don't get it? <laughs> yes, brother, yes. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Uh, we could talk a lot longer, obviously, uh, and, and, and time is limited, but I hope uh, we, we've done justice to your questions a little bit there.